I mean, I could literally stare at this thing all day. It's gorgeous. Like, Hogue's object, eat your heart out. The Cartwheel Galaxy has got one up on you. The Cartwheel Galaxy is in a very rare class of galaxies called Ring Galaxies, just like Hogue's object, which I did a video on a couple of months ago. It consists of like a little elliptical galaxy in the center with this beautiful, bright star forming ring around it. But unlike other ring galaxies, it also has these spokes that go outwards from that central region to the ring itself, which is even more of a rare occurrence for a ring galaxy. It's about 500 million light years away in the constellation of Sculptor, and it's about 150,000 light years across. So slightly bigger than the Milky Way's 100,000 light years across. And it was discovered by Fritz Zwicky back in the 30s, and he described it as one of the most complex structures in the universe that needs its dynamics explaining, aka its history of how it came to be and how its stars are now moving in that ring and central region and those weird spokes. Now you'll notice that the ring in the Cartwheel Galaxy is a lot brighter and bluer than the ring in Hogue's object. Yeah, sure, the ring in Hogue's object is blue, and that does mean that there's a lot of young stars forming there, because they're a lot hotter, and hotter things burn bluer, like a Bunsen burner or a hob flame compared to the reddish glow of like a candle or a fire. But the ring in the cartwheel is clearly much bluer and we see that when we look at it in ultraviolet light as well. There's a lot more ultraviolet light coming from this ring than there is the ring in Hogue's object, which means that it's a lot younger of, of a ring. The ring is also really smooth. It's not like it's clumpy or starbursty in any way. You can see that all of the stars around that ring have clearly formed at the exact same time to have that same level of brightness throughout it. And we think that it was about 200 million years ago. Now it's very strange for that amount of stars to form all at once. Usually it's a lot more clumpy and bursty in a galaxy. You look at a typical spiral galaxy and you can see the really bright points where stars have very recently formed in these big bursts of clumps along the arms. But in the Cartwheel Galaxy, we essentially have that along the entire ring itself. Now the mechanism that's usually posited to explain this whole scenario is a head-on collision of two galaxies, not necessarily a merger, just a collision. That's unlike Hogue's objects where people usually say that it is a merger of two galaxies that have actually coalesced to form that one thing. In the cartwheel what we think has happened is that it was a typical spiral disk galaxy and something has literally punched straight through the very centre of it and out to the other side. It even has two companion galaxies that we think might be responsible for this because when we look to see where a lot of the gas and dust are in this system using radio waves, we can see in the contours which trace out where the radio emission is coming from, there's essentially this gas bridge between the centre of the Cartwheel Galaxy and one of those companion galaxies around it. Now the reason why a head-on collision is so important in this scenario is because it's very similar to like dropping a rock into sand or the same shape you get when uh, an asteroid or a meteor hits into the ground of say the Earth or the Moon. Because in those kind of collisions you form a crater. And so what happens is the material that was once in the center of where that rock probably impacted gets thrown out with the same energy in all directions. And so what you end up forming is a perfect ring of a raised edge of material at the edge of your crater. So if you consider that in a head-on collision of two galaxies where one's just going to go straight and punch through the other side, then the energy in that collision is going to throw out material equally in all directions until you form this ring of gas in a sort of ripple outwards and the shock waves involved in that process as well can then shock the gas and cause it to start forming stars. And that's how we think we've gotten this very, very thin, very obvious bright ring-like structure of stars that have all formed at the same time. And the cartwheel spokes are then explained by saying, well, the collision happened 200 million years ago or so, and now that disk galaxy is starting to reform its spiral arms out from the center and reattach to the ring. But the thing is, when people simulate that happening, it takes a lot longer than 200 million years. It's more around the billion year mark that disks start to reform spiral arms after big collisions or mergers like this. 
So the cartwheel galaxy itself actually casts doubt on this big picture of the collisions and mergers of galaxies producing these rings. So whilst the cartwheel galaxy is breaking a lot of our theories on how these galaxies form, it's also a very useful laboratory to study one of the missing pieces still left in astronomy and astrophysics as well. So because you have this incredibly bright ring of stars that have all formed at the same time, you tend to get a lot of heavier stars and also more binary stars as well. Those kind of things are gonna go supernova and end up in neutron-neutron star pairs or white dwarf neutron star pairs or supernova down to a black hole. Those kind of objects are incredibly bright in the X-ray part of the spectrum because they're incredibly dense and very energetic as well. So the Cartwheel Galaxy is very bright in X-rays. It has a huge abundance of X-ray sources dotted along that ring. So it's a very interesting laboratory to probe these heavier objects in the universe. And in particular, people are very interested in studying these X-ray sources because it might allow us to find an intermediate mass black hole. Now we have a lot of stellar mass black holes, the things that are about like 10 times the mass of the sun or so. And we see a lot of those in our own galaxy because they cause little micro lensing events that briefly brighten background things. And we know that massive stars collapse down into that kind of a mass of a black hole. And LIGO has spotted them with gravitational waves, etc. Then there's super massive black holes that are at the center of every galaxy that are anywhere from 10,000 times the mass of the sun up to say 10, 50 billion times the mass of the sun. But then there's this dearth between the two regimes where we've never really detected anything. I mean, really you'd think there'd be this continuous distribution of masses of black holes, right? Because the smaller black holes would eventually grow and grow and grow and grow to become the heaviest thing in the galaxy, sink to the center and become the supermassive black hole. And you'd think that we'd spot the things that are like a hundred to a thousand solar masses also like causing lensing in our own galaxy, brightening those background things. But we just don't really see them. You know, I don't mean for most of my videos to end up always talking about black holes, but they're just so interesting. I just can't help it. As soon as the topic gets back round to them in some way, I'm just like, oh yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> so because we don't see this continuous distribution of masses from stellar mass black holes to supermassive black holes, it suggests that these intermediate mass black holes between like 100 to 1,000, 10,000 or so solar masses must have different ways of forming. So there's four different ideas floating around for how you might form one of these intermediate mass black holes specifically. The first one is just mergers of smaller black holes. The second one is that you have runaway collision between stars in clusters. The third is that they're primordial black holes, i.e. they were formed at the very start of the universe in the Big Bang. And the fourth one is just accretion of material by the smaller blast smaller mass black holes. So as for the first one, mergers, you know, LIGO has detected the merger of neutron stars and neutron stars, neutron stars, black holes, black holes and black holes. But the most massive thing that's ever been formed is about 80 times the mass of the sun. You're not really hitting those intermediate mass black hole regimes. Now LIGO isn't really sensitive at those frequencies of gravitational waves that would be formed when something heavier actually uh, merged. That's why we haven't really detected anything from a supermassive black hole merger yet either. Let me know in the comments if you actually want me to do a video on this and what LIGO is sensitive to and what we should detect and what we shouldn't detect with LIGO. Either way, you know, it's difficult to confirm whether mergers of these intermediate mass black holes are happening or whether mergers of smaller mass black holes are forming these intermediate mass black holes. The second idea of runaway collision of stars in a globular cluster is getting a lot of tension recently. There was some work in 2002 by Zwart and Macmillan, which showed that there was a large dark mass in the center of a globular cluster. So they worked out the mass of the thing in the center had about 0.1% of the mass of the whole cluster, and said that basically any cluster older than five million years should have had one of these runaway collisions and have an intermediate mass black hole at the center. And so that's why people got excited connecting it with the Cartwheel Galaxy and all of these X-ray sources in there because perhaps you had a black hole accreting material from inside the cluster itself, an intermediate mass black hole, and that could explain why the sources were so bright in the Cartwheel Galaxy as well. It has what we call ultra-luminous X-ray source 
in there that needs to be explained. And if you've had a lot of star formation, you've probably formed a lot of big clusters of stars as well. So very interesting avenue in terms of cartwheel galaxy. The third mechanism, the primordial black holes, you know, this is more of an idea than a fully fledged hypothesis. It's still very much buried in the theory and the mathematics of it all. So I'm not really going to touch on it here, but know that it is a possible explanation for all of this. And the fourth idea is just accretion of material by a stellar mass black hole. For example, something that starts at about 10 times the mass of the sun as the end product of a supernova, and then starts to accrete the material around it at, say, half the mass of the sun a year. After like a million years, that's going to have grown quite large. And as that happens, the accretion happens, it glows in x-rays. So when the Rosat satellite launched back in the 90s and we started to detect all of these ultra-luminous x-ray sources that weren't in the center of galaxies associated with supermassive black holes accreting, people got very excited that they were intermediate mass black holes. Because when you have like a neutron star or a white dwarf or a stellar mass black hole accreting material, yeah, you get X-ray light from that, but it's nowhere near the brightnesses that Rosat was starting to detect, you know, these ultra-luminous X-ray sources. Because the Cartwheel Galaxy hosts seven of these ultra-luminous X-ray sources, as opposed to the one or so that most average galaxies will actually host. And it was Pizzolatto and collaborators in 2010 that suggested the brightest of those ultra-luminous X-ray sources could be powered by a hundred times the mass of the sun black hole, which is just pushing into that intermediate mass black hole regime, which is why there's been so much focus on the Cartwheel Galaxy. Then in 2012, Presswitch and collaborators found that there was a correlation between the number of, of these ultra-luminous X-ray sources in a galaxy and the star formation rate, which is really telling in the Cartwheel Galaxy because we know that that big ring of material has formed stars all at the same time in a very high burst of star formation rate a couple of hundred million years ago. And they said to reproduce that correlation between the number of ultraluminous X-ray sources and the star formation rate of a galaxy in models, they needed to increase the number of binary stars formed and also the number of collisions between stars in the clusters formed in that star formation episode as well, which points towards like this joint accretion and merger scenario needed to make the ultraluminous x-ray sources seen in the cartwheel and perhaps suggest that intermediate mass black holes get to that level by both merging and accreting material. So the Cartwheel Galaxy is not just a pretty face. It's essentially a laboratory where we can test our biggest ideas of how galaxies evolve and change shape through collisions and mergers, but also how black holes themselves grow. And I think, you know, while preparing for this video, the Cartwheel Galaxy may have just moved the Penguin Galaxy off the number one spot on my list of favorite galaxies ever. Light years away in the constellation of... <coughs> oh, where's my water? Water, no. Brown skin girl. Your skin just like pearls, the best thing in the world. Do you want anybody else in? It's called the Ring Galaxies, like Hoge of Hoge Object. I mean, you did a whole video on it. You've got to be able to pronounce Hoge's Object. Hoge's Object.